within Judaism, and that was beginning to trickle into the life of the church. And the Hellenistic uh, Christians now were saying, hey, our widows are being overlooked. The Hebrew ones, those that were fully Jewish and acted Jewish uh, until they became like Christians, they're being taken care of, but our old ladies are not. This is a problem. And so the apostles were like, look, we cannot give up our main ministry to take care of this important but lesser ministry. And so we need to do something about that. And so this is what happened. Therefore, our brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And when they, what they said pleased the whole gathering and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, uh, and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and uh, Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and, and Parmenas, uh, not from Parma, but different one, and uh, Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. You're about to see that happen right here. So when the, the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests, the Jewish priests, became obedient to the faith. So what did deacons do? Number one, they helped to keep the church properly focused. So here is part of what they do. Notice at the end of verse two, the apostles were like, look, it is not right for us to give up the preaching of the word of God to serve tables. As important as that is, that is not what the apostles, the leadership, needed to be doing. They needed to be spending more of their time in the word, preaching the word, and praying. So this is the spiritual leadership that really only they could do, and they could not give that up. Otherwise, everyone would suffer as a result of that. So they helped to keep the church properly focused. I think I just lost. Oh, there we go. Sorry. All right. So again, verse four, they said, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So that while there are many good things a church can do, our priority as a church must always be on the word of God and on prayer. Amen. This is our main mission. We need to take the word of God into the world. We need to be praying for the world. We need to be praying for each other. This must be our priority. Everything suffers if we don't do this. If we diminish that, make it secondary, everything else falls apart. So deacons also help, we just lost something, there we go. Deacons also help meet the practical needs of the church family. So it's not to say that there's not important things that go on, but they're the ones who are tasked with that responsibility of making sure that practical things are taken care of. Uh, so notice that they are to work with the daily distribution. This is an administrative kind of task. They are making sure that the food is there and that the right people are getting the right food at the right time. This is clearly an administrative task and administrative duty. I'm so glad, glad that God has given that because if you look at my spiritual gifting, administration is down at the bottom. Actually, the bottom is here and administration is just kind of down below that. And so I'm so thankful that God complements those kind of giftings. Uh, and, and that's a, a beautiful and wonderful thing. So while they're not the spiritual leaders, they're still an administrative role that deacons can and will play within the life of the church. Third, deacons help to foster unity within the church family. Notice it was the complaint by the Hellenists against the Hebrews. And so their task is to make sure that they bring both of those groups into unity in Christ. And that is a beautiful and wonderful thing. Uh, that, that God has given us as a church family. Our task is not to attain unity. Our job is to maintain the unity that we already have in Jesus. And that is part of the task of what deacons do. Um, and so notice that they choose uh, Stephen and all these other guys. Uh, and notice that all of these men have Hellenistic names. So when they thought about who needed to be taking care of the daily distrib distribution of food. They didn't do just a, an equal split between them that we have the Hebrews and the Hellenistic. They just gave that task entirely to the Hellenists. What a beautiful act of trust 
on the part of those that were from that Hebrew dominant side to be able to do that within the life of the church fam. Fourth, deacons must be qualified. Notice that they are uh, told to pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty. So number one, good reputation. Number two, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And number three, they are full of wisdom. Deacons need to be wise in the way that they help the church, in the way that they help to handle conflict. And this is part of what the church needs to look for in deacons. And, but looking for deacons and looking for qualified people, that process should never, ever be rushed. Uh, in verse, first, uh, first Timothy 5.22, do not hurry to lay hands on anyone. This is the Amplified Bible. Ordaining and approving someone for ministry or an office in the church or in reinstating expelled offenders and thereby sharing the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. Um, notice also that the person should not be too young in the faith. This should not be a new convert. 1 Timothy 3, 6. He must not be a recent convert or he may be puffed up uh, with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. I love seeing leadership being developed here. I love seeing young leaders being able to step in to ministry leadership roles and serving and growing. But what we want to be careful is that someone has a solid foundation in the faith, even if it's not been a long time since their conversion. We want to see some spiritual maturity in that person. We want to see some humility in that person, not just some. We want to see a lot of humility. Uh, we want to see a lot of wisdom. We want to see evidence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And we want to see that their lives have that good reputation. So what are the qualifications? These are listed out in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 8, deacons likewise, just like elders, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and they must be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. So number one, they need to be dignified. They need to have a solid character, worthy of respect, not clowns. Doesn't mean that they don't have a sense of humor, but that they have that ability to take things seriously and yet bring levity when there is that need for levity, but they should not be clowning around and not serious about life in the church. Second, not double-tongued. We don't need hypocritical people. We need men of integrity. We need people who say something and they do exactly the same thing, that what they are saying in life their lives measure up to that. There's not a, a disconnect between the two. Not addicted to much wine. Doesn't mean that they can't drink wine, but they should never have the reputation of getting drunk. They should not be heavy drinkers. They should be self-controlled. And so this is a very important uh, aspect there. They should not be greedy for dishonest gain. They should not be the one who are always uh, promoting the next get-rich-quick quick scheme, the next multi-level marketing thing, and so forth. These are people who have confidence in God to provide for them. It doesn't mean they're not hardworking or aspiring uh, to provide for their family as much as they can, but they should not be marked by greed and a lack of satisfaction in the Lord's provision. They need to be trustworthy with money. Greedy men cannot be trusted with money. And it's a dangerous thing to put men in leadership who lack the confidence in the provision that God has given. That can be detrimental to the life of the church. Number five, they must hold to the mystery of the faith. So spiritual and theological maturity. They ought to be able to clearly articulate the gospel, clearly articulate the basic tenets of the faith, and be able to defend those to some level. Six, they need to be tested. And this is what we do. We want to vet the people that are recommended and nominated to be deacons. We want to see in their life a walk with the Lord and service before they're appointed as a deacon. If you're not serving before you're a deacon, you're not going to serve after. If you're not evangelizing before you're a deacon, you're probably not going to be evangelizing after you're a deacon. And so we want to see the evidence of this in life beforehand, not waiting to after the fact. Guys, not every man is currently qualified to serve as a deacon. But men... Every one of you should strive to be qualified to serve as a deacon. Amen? There's great benefit in being a deacon. There's great privilege in that. And 
all of us should be striving for spiritual maturity. So make it your goal to have the kind of walk with the Lord where you are growing in Christ. So if you've not been through one-on-one -on -one personal discipleship, talk to DeJour. DeJour will get you set up. If you're not involved in Bible study with a group of men, you need to start that. If you're not serving yet, let's start finding ways for you to serve so that you can develop those skills in serving the church fam. Amen? Oh, come on now. Amen. All right. On the other side, there is a deacon wife consideration as well. Notice 1 Timothy 3.11. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderous, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. So again, the wives should be dignified. They should have a solid character. They should be worthy of respect and not drama queens. Because in the life of a deacon, you're going to see many of the things that are happening in church life. And we do not need wives that are going to just overreact and create more of a problem than helping to solve. And so th that's part of the consideration when we're looking at a deacon is what is the character of their wife? Because that's important in the eyes of God. They should not be slanderers. They need to be people who build up others. They don't need to be gossips and, sl and, and talking bad about others. And, and shouldn't be just always ready to, to, to pick up, what, what's the latest news? And, and, and tell me, and, oh, I can't wait to tell you about what's going on when so-and-so. You've got to have discretion because life gets shared with deacons and deacon couples. And, and there needs to be that level of, of responsibility with your tongue that if somebody shares the deepest things with you or your husband, it does not go anywhere else. Amen? That's for the integrity of the church. You would not want that done for you. And so you don't do that with others as well. And this is just generally speaking as well. They need to be sober-minded. So there's a self-controlled aspect. There should be emotional maturity, spiritual maturity, and they should be thoughtful, not reactive. And then faithful in all things, dependable, trustworthy. If they say they're going to be there, they're going to be there. It's not a thing of we have an appointment and, oh, no, something came up all the time. That there's a fickleness about them. That, that's, that's not an acceptable thing. That if, if, if there is a commitment to be at Bible study, if there's a commitment to be in discipleship, if there's a commitment to be at worship, then you can count on that person to be there constantly. They overcome the obstacles in order to get to where they need to be. Yes, life gets lifey. But the mature person is able to deal with that and move on and even help others in the process. So just like we challenged the, the, the husbands, wives, if your husband were tapped to be a deacon today, is there anything in your life that would prevent him from being ordained as a deacon? And so every woman here, if you're married, you should strive to be qualified to be a deacon's wife. At the very least, you should be able to, to be in a position where your life does not disqualify your husband from being able to serve. And that's a tragedy when there are gifted men who have unqualified wives and it, and it disqualifies from service. So do what you need to do. Let's not hinder the kingdom. Amen? Oh, let's try that again. Ladies, amen? I know that's hard, but let's make that happen. Family leadership consideration, this is also part of this. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their households well. Family is a man's first ministry, and it is a deacon's first ministry. Amen? Amen, that's right. Leading one's own family is an important indicator of how well you can serve the church family as well. And so this is part of what we look at. Look at. How, how do you parent? How, are your children running out of control? Or are they well-behaved? Are they growing in Christ? Are they being discipled by you? Is it evident that, that you are pouring scripture into their lives? And we should hear that from your children and see that in the way that they live and in the way that they walk. 
Uh, and so your children are an important part, your family as a whole. How do you spend time with your wife? Are you dating your wife? Are you helping to foster her and feed her and disciple her? Divorce, here's that other thing. Let each be the husband of one wife. Doesn't mean that single guys can't serve. But if you are married, it should be one wife. So divorce is not an immediate disqualifier in my mind, but it raises flags. What are the circumstances of that divorce? Did that happen before you came to faith in Christ or after? What were the circumstances of that divorce? Had there been marital unfaithfulness on their part or on your part? Or was it just something that you guys gave up on? And, and so divorce is one of those important uh, indicators of the faithfulness of the guy that's coming in. And so this raises other questions when we're testing, when we're vetting that person, we need to ask those questions about, tell me about that divorce if there is one. What were the circumstances around that? E, deaconing well has benefits. Verse 13, for those who serve as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence that is in Christ Jesus. I love to see the growth in my deacons, our deacons. I love to see how God uses that place of service to shape them and mold them so that they're looking and smelling more like Jesus in, you, in, in new and special ways. And there is something significant about that. So men strive to be qualified to serve as a deacon. I want to take you back to 2022. We had a lot of new believers in here, men who were not yet qualified, and so I was excited about what was being set up in the future, but it was kind of grieving to my heart that in that moment, we did not have anyone qualified or willing to serve. And the church suffers during times like that. And we should never, ever, ever have a shortage of men. Our problem should be we only have two slots and we have 16 men that are qualified. Who should we be choosing? That would be my great delight. And so let's strive to do that so that the church never suffers like that. By the way, we will be doing another deacon selection starting in August. We want to make sure that we have, during the interim phase, between me and whoever the next pastor God brings in, we want to have a solid cadre of deacons. So guys, just kind of park that, be, begin praying about that, and we'll start that process at the beginning of August. When we're talking about deaconing, the way up is down. And this is really the Christian life as a whole. Mark 10, 42 uh, and, uh, through 45 uh, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be the first uh, must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you want a slogan for your life, let it be verse 45. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. What Jesus modeled for us should be what we are striving to do. Deacons enable church growth. Going back to Acts chapter 6, the last verse, and the word of God, because of the, what the deacons were doing in their ministry and helping to distribute the food, the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the Jewish priests became obedient to the faith. Wow. When the church is strong, when we have the kind of leadership in place, and that leadership is doing what it needs to be doing, and we are equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, we see great things happen. And it is amazing to see what God is doing here at Aviana Baptist Church right now. Amen. And I look forward to seeing what he's going to be doing in the days ahead. So what do Aviona Baptist Church deacons do specifically? Number one, they assist the pastor with the two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. So here in a moment, you get to see that in action as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Secondly, they minister to deployed spouses and families. If you are ever in that position, ladies, where your husband is deployed, if you need help, contact our deacons. You are not alone, and there is help available. And that is part of what their role is. 
And if, if you need anything, swing set blows over because of a summer storm and you need somebody to help set it up so your kids don't go crazy, that's what they're there for. If you need something uh, help fixed or getting whatever, their job is to help you get that need. So guys, if you are deployed, you be the man, if you're hearing your wife struggle and you contact the deacons and ask for help, amen? Don't leave your wife struggling. You got help. You have brothers in the Lord that are happy, delighted to serve. I love the servant hearts of our deacons. Anything that needs to be done, they're willing to do it and they do it quietly. They do it without notice. And that is exactly the way it needs to be done. They are doing so much that you don't even see. And it's a delight to me. One of the first things when Justin became deacon, there was a spot right here where every time I stood, it would sink and there was a loud creak. And I was absolutely convinced I'm going through this floor one day. Justin climbed up underneath here, scooch, scooch, scooch from that end, I believe, and fixed it. Simple little thing. The steps on the baptistry, too tall. People feeling like they're going to fall into the water when they got to the top. Nosebleed at their, as they're standing up there. Next thing I know, it's fixed. It's just beautiful and wonderful to see the kind of things that they do. Just serving the church family, and serving individuals within the church, making sure that things happen. I love our deacons. Amen? Mm. Third, they assist the pastor with reaching out to new people. As we are moving now into a transition phase, this new member orientation and following up with new members, we are given a whole lot more uh, to the deacon so that they will be able to do that and it will happen seamlessly even when there's not a pastor here. They assist the pastor with meet, meeting spiritual needs of the church family, uh, particularly to, in times of crisis or sickness or death. When you need prayer, these are men that love to pray. These are men that are not afraid to pray bold prayers with you and for you. This is why at the end of the service, we give you that opportunity. That if you have things that are on your heart, struggles or, 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 or things that you're wrestling with in life, these men are here to pray with you and for you. Take advantage of that. You're among friends. Coming up to pray with them doesn't mean you're deficient or a loser and you can't do it. It means that you have trust in the God of the universe to fix whatever is going on, to enable you to do whatever it is that God wants you to do. Take advantage of that time. And if it's not here, then grab them after the servant and say, hey, can you take a moment and pray with me now? And each and every one of them would be absolutely delighted to do that with you. And then finally, they help meet the practical needs of the church and the church family. Fixing steps, fixing a stage, setting a, a, a swing set back upright, real event that happened, other things like that that go on. They are there to help meet practical, physical, material needs when they can. So what does this mean for us? It means that we need to pray for our deacons and our church leadership every week. And we need the, the spirit and the power of God to enable us to do what God has called us to do. Second, men strive to be worthy and willing to serve as a deacon. What an incredible opportunity that is. So make that your ambition. Make that your goal. God, make me worthy enough and humble enough and servant enough to be able to serve my church family in that way. Third, serving is every believer's job. If you're a member here, where are you serving? If you're not, let's find that place. Church doesn't happen automatically. Church only happens when we rise up and make it happen with the gifts and the empowerment that the Holy Spirit gives us. And every single person needs to find that place to be able to serve. Because if we all serve, nobody has to do too much. But if only a few serve, the burden is laid on a few people. And folks, that ain't right. It's not right for us to be consumers and bench warmers. We need to find that place to serve and plug in. God saved you to make the kingdom bigger and stronger. Let's pull our weight and do what we can. So how do you need to respond today? What is it that God has laid upon your heart? How has he challenged you? 
What has he convicted you of? Let's take a moment, and we're going to pray. I'm going to give you that opportunity. Uh, I'm going to ask Sal, if you would. You're, you're close here. Just play quietly. And uh, if you need to, to pray, to respond to God, let me invite you to do that. Second thing, while you're doing that, prepare your heart to receive the Lord's Supper. Third thing, we're about to bring up our two deacon candidates and lay hands on them and ordain them. And so pray for Nick and pray for Landon. And in just a moment, we're going to bring them up and we're going to charge you and charge them in the eyes and the sight of God to live out their ministry very well here at Aviana Baptist Church. So take a moment and respond to God as he's been speaking to you right now. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your encouragement, your direction, your clarity that you bring. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving your church and giving your life for her. Thank you that you have loved each and every one of us individually far, far more than we ever deserve. Thank you for loving the church to give us clarity and direction. Thank you for gifting us with leadership. Thank you now for raising up men of God who are able, qualified, willing to serve as deacons. Father, I do pray that you would challenge all of our men, that you would convict each and every one deep at the core of their being to live a life worthy of such a calling. That there would be nothing to disqualify them, nothing that would prevent them but you would grow them more into the image of Christ and the spiritual maturity, that they would serve and serve well to the glory of your name. Father, I pray for the wives and the women here, that you would cause them, make them, form them to be dignified women, worthy of respect, people who are able to take confidence in them, because of their discretion, their maturity, their wisdom. May there be nothing in any of the wives that would prevent service in the kingdom. And may you use the women here very well. May they serve well and bring glory and honor to your name. God, you have saved us to make the kingdom bigger and stronger. And you have given so many hands here. May every hand be used for the sake of your kingdom. May none sit idle. May none sit in insecurity, feeling like they can't serve. But may we all step up and serve. May we have the same heart of Jesus. May we realize that we're not here to be served, we're here to serve. And we're here to give our lives for many. So Lord, let us have the heart of Christ fully here at Aviona Baptist Church. God, I'm so thankful that we get to celebrate the Lord's Supper today. I pray that we would all take this in a way that is worthy, that we would be mindful of the body and the blood of Jesus and the great sacrifice that was made for us. And now as these two men come, we praise your great name for your marvelous work of grace in their lives to mold and shape them into the men of God that they are right now. Thank you for calling them for such a time as this. And so, Father, as a church family, may we be clear-minded, fully present in this moment as we lay hands on these gentlemen and ordain them for this very special role that you have given to the church family. So let your will be done perfectly right here in this room, just as it is in heaven. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. I'm going to invite Nick DeAnda, Landon Ellis to come down front, please. And we're going to need Elizabeth and Jocelyn in just a moment. So hold your places there. Come on in and have a seat, gentlemen. And so this morning we have something very, very special to do. 
and that is to ordain Nick DeAnda and Landon Ellis as deacons at Aviana Baptist Church. The apostles told the church in Acts 6 to choose seven men from among you who were known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. These men were specifically set aside to serve the practical hands-on needs of the church. Here that means serving as wise spiritual counsel to me and for you, preparing the Lord's Supper, uh, serving uh, in baptisms, ministering to families and deployed spouses, and serving as decision and prayer counselors. Ordination is simply a public act of commissioning, if you will, men for ministry service. And the church played a significant role in the first ordination service, just as it does today. You guys have observed Nick and Landon's godly character. You've seen their commitment demonstrated through faithful service. And they've been examined and tested by me, by our deacons. And they have been found to meet the biblical qualifications for servants as deacons. And that has been affirmed by you as a church family as we voted on them just recently. But in order to serve the Lord fully in the way that the office deserves, it is important they know that the church is behind them. So I charge us, the body of Aviano Baptist Church, with the following. Let me ask you to stand now. We, the body of Aviano Baptist Church, do accept our brothers Nick and Landon as disciples of this, uh, as deacons of this church. We pledge them our love, our prayers, our encouragement, and our support in this high calling. Church, if you accept this charge, please respond by saying amen. amen. You may be seated. And now I'd like to invite uh, Jared, one of our deacons, to come up and administer the deacon's charge.
Pastor Randy, would you have formally sought an ordination of the body? Ordination, as we talked about, is simply the act of the church setting men aside to serve in a ministry role. As Nick and Landon sit now, let me invite you guys to sit, their wives will stand behind them. So stand behind them, lay your hands on them, don't choke them. <laughs> I'm, I'm so thankful for the godly wives of these men. Uh, they have proven themselves over and over, and it is a delight and a joy uh, to have you guys standing behind these men because oftentimes uh, as these serve, it is, will many times be you guys serving together. And certainly you ladies will be standing behind them, encouraging them, praying for them, prodding them at times. And it is a wonderful thing to have a help meet suitable, perfectly suited for them. And I'm thankful for the godly examples that you ladies are and that you will be in the days ahead. So in Acts 6, after they chose men to serve as deacons, they laid their hands on them and prayed over them. And that's what we'll do today, asking the Lord to bless them and their families as they serve. The laying on of hands, again, provides no special power or privilege, but it signifies a high calling and a privilege and responsibility. As in the tradition of the first church, I'd also like to invite any ordained men, uh, Pastor Sam, to come on down forward and any others who may be ordained to come forward and to join uh, Jared and I in the laying on the hands as we set Nick and Landon aside uh, for this role as, as, as deacons within the life of Aviana Baptist Church. So go ahead and come on up. Church family, let me invite you to now stand and we're going to lay hands and pray over these men right now. Pastor Sam, if you would, lay your hands on Nick. And Pastor Sam, if you would, uh, lead us in a prayer of ordination, and I will close out that, that prayer there. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful today that there are young men who are allowing your spirit to work in their lives, to grow them, to qualify them, to give them a spirit of willingness to serve you in this church. We ask you, Lord, to bless these two brethren, their wives, their families, and through them, Lord, bless this church as they undertake this duty of being a servant and help all of us move forward in our growth in our relationship with you. We just thank you, Lord, for loving us, for providing all of our needs, and we seek you to continue for being great uh, resources you give us to meet the needs of this church. And we thank you for them, and we pray for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, we lift up Landon and Nick to you now. In the name of Jesus, we as a church family set these men aside to serve as uh, deacons, at Aviano Baptist Church. We pray for the empowering of the Holy Spirit to come upon them to enable them to serve well as deacons. May your name be glorified through them. May the kingdom grow. May it multiply exponentially because of their service to you and their service to Aviano Baptist Church. I pray that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit. I pray that they would be full of wisdom. I pray that you would protect them from the enemy that they would always and ever be men of good repute within this community. And so, Lord, we pray for their families. We ask for your hand of protection on them. We ask that they would all grow closer together and closer to you. May their children be godly examples. May their wives exude godliness in every way. May they be the kind of women that the women of Aviana Baptist Church in this community can look up to as a godly example. So, Father, we pray for your blessing on Landon and on Elizabeth. We pray for your blessing now on uh, Nick and on Jocelyn. And we, as a church family, covenant together to pray for them, to encourage them, and to help them to serve you well. And so, Lord, we give you the praise and the glory for the days ahead. And we ask this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Thank you, guys. You may return to your seats. <laughs> Amen. At this time, we get to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And although they, uh, and Landon, Landon, you're, you're distracted by your godly wife there, man. 
Come on back up. And Nick, if you don't mind, stand over with Jared. Um, as our new inductees, they've not yet really uh, been trained or, or anything, but we want you to stand here as part of the Lord's Supper. And um, as we begin, we want to look at the, the, the reading of Scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where we are given instruction on how to do this thing and why we do this. And so Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. And so as we come today, uh, we're going to have this side over here come up here. This side over here will go to that table and we'll have the first uh, three rows do this. Lord, this table is open to anyone who has professed faith in Jesus and has uh, followed the Lord in baptism. If that is not you, if you're not there yet, this is not for you. We invite you to observe. If you have children who have not yet placed their faith in Jesus and followed in baptism, we invite you to uh, allow them to observe but not participate. This is a gluten-free kind of thing, so if that's a concern for you, this is okay. On the outside of the juice is grape juice. On the inside is wine. So you can make that, that choice appropriately. And so, again, as we heard in Scripture, we want to eat this together. So as you come and you take the elements, go back to your seat and just wait, and we will all take the, the elements at the same time together. And so at this time, uh, I will pray, and then we will come up and, and do this. Father, I thank you so much for your goodness and grace. I thank you for the privilege of being called to remind, uh, remembrance on a regular basis, your deep, deep love for us. And so today, our worthiness is not found in our own righteousness. Our worthiness is found in you because of the body and blood of Jesus. And so we don't take this as just a, a little holy snack now at the end of a service, but we do this as a holy and sacred moment being mindful of your grace and your sacrifice for us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bless this, bless those who partake, and may we all draw closer to you and closer to each other as we're reminded of our unity in Christ through the sharing of this common bread, this common drink. And so, God, we give you the praise and the glory now in Jesus' name. Uh, and let me invite those on the first three rows on this side to go ahead and come this way, first three rows, come out to the center aisle and then around that way and go back from the outside there.
It says on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks. You may be seated. And I'm going to ask uh, Landon, our new deacon here, if he would, uh, to ask a blessing on the bread. Amen. And Jesus said, take and eat, do this in remembrance of him. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And I'm going to ask Nick if he would to ask a blessing on the cup. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. I'm going to ask Jared, if he would, to just uh, pray for us and ask for a blessing now. Amen. Scripture says, uh, as often as we eat this bread and drink this blood, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is not just a look back kind of meal. It's an anticipation of that meal that we get to share with Jesus at the marriage feast of the Lamb. So as we typically do, we want to pray that old Aramaic prayer, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. So say that with me now. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Scripture says uh, when they celebrated that first, la that last supper, uh, that they sang a hymn and, and went out. And we want to, to do something that we under sing here. I don't even know if we have sung it uh, yet, and I apologize. And that is that old, wonderful hymn called the doxology. And so if you would stand with me as we sing the doxology together. Ladies? to be in the Lord's house today. I'm going to invite uh, Landon and Nick, if you guys would just stand right outside that door. I know a lot of people want to put some love on you guys. 
and bless you as we go today. Uh, just a reminder, I'm getting on a plane tomorrow morning, get to go see my wife and granddaughter and uh, get to see my final kid get married. So woohoo! Praise God. Get them all gone. <laughs> No, we're excited and looking forward to it. We will miss you guys. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we have some very capable men uh, that are going to be preaching. Uh, we have uh, Pastor Sam is going to be preaching, uh, I think, next week. Is that right? Uh, and then we also have uh, John Chan and uh, preaching for the very first time. So his rookie appearance, Brother Tim Mason. So and looking forward to that. You guys be praying for them. Pray for them. Give them lots of encouragement. If you need anything while I'm gone, make sure you just talk to one of the deacons and they will be glad to, to help you out. Uh, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Yeah. Wait, wait. Almost forgot. One, one, one important thing. Sorry, sorry, guys. You guys were well into it also. I, I just <laughs> totally messed you up. I have gelato gift certificates for the kiddos. So if you've got kids, parents, come see me with your kiddos. Would love to give that to them as a gift. I had that last week and forgot. April is uh, Military Kid Appreciation Month. And I just wanted to appreciate your kiddos and love on them. I don't know if I have enough today because they're, wow, so many kids, but I would be glad to, to give you uh, the certificates so they don't lose them and maybe you can get the gelato instead.